It takes all kinds to make the revolutions. The queens are poor and raunchy. They live on what others no longer want. They have no power. They have no social place. They almost have no allies. All this makes them angry and amused. It makes them restless and out of place. It makes them high-spirited and disruptive. They know that it takes all kinds to make the revolutions. Others do not know this yet. The queens are out and are not coming back. They wait for the others to join them. The queens find the queer men a source of infinite amusement. Did you see that? A queen yells as a queer man walks by. His eyeballs were bouncing all over the street. Try not to see you in your pink to feta bathrobe. Trying to get a good glimpse of my basket. The queens think the fairies are cute. But how can you live with all those trees all the time? I mean, I hear they don't even have sidewalks there. The queens think the faggots are sweet, but not yet serious. I saw them holding hands. Well, my dear, everyone holds hands these days. The queens find the women a source of infinite inspiration. Get a load of scarlet red hair tearing up the drapes to make himself a frock. Sadie Tom Tom is fucking upset because his missionary couldn't get it up last night. The queens remain originals, not like any of the others that the men will ever see. From deep in the elaborate rubble where the queens dress comes a cry. We must do something. The situation is fast approaching the desperate. Suspecting a queen's private drama, the others continue to create themselves in silence. Soon, when they have no one left to throw their bombs at, they're going to start throwing them at us. Mark my word, queens. They're making more bombs every day. More and more, and what do you think they're going to do with them? I mean, we know the men are crazed. I tell you, the shit has got to stop. Now the other queens listen, for they knew the cry of insight which can precede propaganda by the deed. I mean, they've got more instruments of destruction than anybody ever. And they're not just going to sit around and stroke all those bombs. They're going to use them. They're spending everybody's money to make all those horrid things. Really, germs and nasty chemicals, and what the fuck do you think they're going to do with all this shit? Honey, you and me are going to get it unless we get them first. The others knew what he said and were ready for the concrete. But the queen who spoke what they all knew to be true lost himself in self-creation. And, for the moment, the moment passed. The faggots have the routines of community and the rhythms of the streets to live by. Visiting, lunches at small cafes, late day tea, walks, accidental encounters, organizing, issuing manifestos, putting on plays, changing lovers, shifting alliances and living arrangements, and gossip, endless gossip. They share shifting notions about the men and power and how to take it away from them. They find routines in their collective lives and turn them into rituals. They created the ritual of the brief encounter, the ritual of dying love, and the ritual of outrageousness. They live in a world invisible to the men. Moonbeam is one of the faggots. Moonbeam loves those whom the rejected have rejected. He learns most from those who have lost all that the shabby world has to offer. He searches for those who have lost the respect of all others, but have kept their own self-respect. One day he met Ava Destruction, a queen who had lost his energy for splendor and his desire for comfort. He wore garbage and dirt to blend in with the streets. In the midst of the filth shone his eyes. When Moonbeam saw Ava's eyes, he relaxed and began to weep. He knew he had found one who could teach what he had to know. With Ava, he learned that he could break all the men's rules. With Ava, he learned how to break the most fundamental of the men's rules. With Ava, he became a complete non-man. He no longer looked like a man, or talked like a man, or acted like a man, or felt like a man. Moonbeam was happy. One bright afternoon, Moonbeam caught the interested eye of another faggot walking past him. They both slowed down and quickly found an excuse to stop. Moonbeam looked in a shop window. The other faggot cleaned his fingernails. They glanced at each other, and as the ritual for brief encounters prescribed, smiled discreetly. The other faggot moved slowly on down the street, looking back twice to indicate that Moonbeam should follow. He did, his heart pounding and his imagination running wild. They entered an abandoned building, and amidst the debris, without a word, made delicious love. The other faggot's name was Loose Tomato, and he and Moonbeam became friends. Loose Tomato loves to fuck up. The men, obsessed with propriety, demand polite action from others in their world. Loose tomato is never proper. In the men's indoctrination centers, he farts in the classroom. 
He calls the teacher's boss. He smokes magic substances in the halls. He steals silk bed sheets from the president's house, and he wears cheap dresses to elegant occasions to which he has not been invited in the first place. When he drinks too much of the men's deadly elixirs, he leaves consciousness, and then he can piss in empty waste baskets, throw up on the carpet before dinner, and walk naked in the streets. His manner is tough and crude, but his soul is kindly and generous and laughing. He is always dancing on the boundary between eccentricity and insanity. He cultivates the spontaneous and the unexpected, which can lead one absolutely anywhere. Lilac is a friend of Moonbeam and Loose Tomato. They met one night in a dark corner. They moved quickly, nearly without noticing, from warm talk and laughter to deep friendship. Lilac is a romantic addict. In telling a story or doing an action, Lilac always exaggerates or dramatizes, as he likes to think of it. This makes things more real for others. Pine Tree is Lilac's sometimes lover. Pine Tree is idealistic yet sensible and down to earth. He can be easily seduced by the deep, longing look in Lilac's eyes. Lilac and Pine Tree met in an orange grove. Each was alone and hungry for touch. Their first days together, they did not speak. They kissed and licked and sucked and caressed until the hunger was gone, and they knew they were no longer alone. Passion, a precious gift from the great goddess, flowed around them. Lilac sometimes wept, but he mostly purred. He purred after a quiet meal in the garden. He purred walking hand in hand with pine tree in soft rains on cool city nights. He purred lying naked on hot faggot beaches as the waves covered his body wrapped around pine tree. Some days lilac would be in a trance. The smell of pine tree's body would stain his pores and make his nose twitch all day. They made love at night and in the morning and the odors would get strong and definite and hypnotizing. The odors evoked love and spurred on love and made lilac remember love. By afternoon, they would begin to fade, and Lilac would retire for small moments to smell himself and what remained of Pine Tree. These days were best when they were spent with his cats. The cats knew, for they too could become transfixed by love and smells. He would lie naked on the bed, and the cats would smell him and lick off the love that Pine Tree had spread all over him. And as they licked, they would become, like Lilac, abstract and transformed. They would lie with him and their noses would twitch as they all tried to keep the memory of love alive and well. Lilac, in his joy, pressed flowers and sent them to his friends. He made things out of lace and ribbons and bright paper. He wore long robes and danced in the sun. To see people and plants grow made his heart calm. He moved across the marred landscape of Ramrod, finding quiet places to love in visiting the great gardens of the fairies, gossiping behind closed doors with the queens and acknowledging the women who love women, lounging on the hot sidewalks of the ruined cities. As he yearned for Pine Tree's arms, he found romance everywhere. His heart stayed open to anyone who would pretend with him for a moment that love could thrive in the paranoid weirdness of the men. Lilac is never sentimental, for sentimentality makes him weak, and weakness means defeat by the men. He is, however, superstitious. When the morning glories that he and Pine Tree planted together refused to grow, he knew their passion was growing weak. Warm, caring, gentle friendship then began to grow. Pine Tree dreams of a glorious, nonviolent revolution. Between the dreams, he is proficient in the practical. He is certain that he has enough money, which means he always has more than he needs. He is certain that he has a place to live, which means he always has several places to live. He stays in solitude a lot to keep his dream of the glorious nonviolent revolution alive, and he wishes Lilac and the others would stay with him in his dreams. To make his dreams real, he lives quietly through his reactionary emotions. He experiences desires to control his environment, and he experiences jealousy when his pleasures are threatened, and he experiences possessiveness of property. He accepts these emotions much as he accepts depression and the men's brutality. They have to be acknowledged and gotten through. To make his dreams real, he celebrates his revolutionary emotions. He experiences joy in sharing, and he experiences completeness in loving, and he experiences satisfaction in work for others done with compassion. These emotions he writes up on papers stuck to walls and tells strangers about on boats. These he will not forget. If he can live as if the glorious nonviolent revolution has happened long enough, he will awake one day to find that it has happened. 
Sometimes he is confused about the meaning of what he feels. Then he is depressed and afraid and longs for his friends Lilac and Loose Tomato and Moonbeam to sit with him. Hollyhock lives in the faggot community of the devastated city. He inhabits a cool space where faggots, weary of the streets, refresh themselves. He entertains all who visit with funny stories of the old days when it was bad. His body is bloated, his face lined, and his hair is falling out. Yet Hollyhock in Runes is still magnificent to view. The weary faggots sit in the coolness, drinking quietly, watching the beauty live in the decay of Hollyhock's body. But Hollyhock does not live here in contentment. He likes his cool space and his faggot friends, but he feels cut off from something that if he had would make him feel more whole, and he does not know what it is. So he entertains and his life goes on. Yet at night alone he wonders what is missing and if he will ever find it. Heavenly Blue worried all the time. He worried about the bills and the roof that needed repairing and the strange men who always watched the house and what the neighbors might do next and about Hollyhock's unhappiness. He worried most of all that he would go mad. His worrying got the bills paid and the roof fixed and drove the men away and calmed the neighbors down and helped Hollyhock be happier. And finally, his worrying drove him mad. It was the madness of looking inward and being afraid. There had never been enough love and warmth around him, and he thought that he had gradually dried up inside. He wanted out, but he did not know where out was. Lilac and Pine Tree and Moonbeam and Loose Tomato and Hollyhock gathered. They held Heavenly Blue in their arms for days. They let him cry and stare and slobber and scream and be silent. They paid the bills and looked after the roof and watched the streets for strange men and talked to the neighbors, and Hollyhock kept himself happy. Their house filled up with comfort and routine and gladness until Heavenly Blue could no longer resist and became responsible again. Heavenly Blue now had a house filled with his friends. Contentment overwhelmed him. After much chattiness, they all decided to call themselves the Tribe of the Rising Suns. Everyone felt quite elated about the name and about the house and about Heavenly Blue's recovery. They painted the house pink and the trim lavender. They carved peacock feathers in the wood around the door and planted roses in the front yard. They all began again to be who they were. Quickly, they all go out into the neighborhood to discover their friends and find a faggot world being made. Next door lived the tribe of angel flesh. The concept of angel flesh makes lilac quiver and loose tomato giggle with glee. The house of angel flesh is old, elaborate, and slightly tilted. Vines completely cover the crumbling porches. Inside is misty, hung with soft fabrics and the smells of jasmine and the sacred substances. Lilac was, when he entered for the first time, immediately calm. Each room in the house is devoted to a different living form. One is filled with velvets and feathers and makeup and sparkles and costumes and silks. It is where the faggots go when they want to transform themselves. Another room is for plants to live in. Another is for quiet music, another is for silent eating, and another is for methodically drinking teas of healing herbs. All who live there move softly about the house, living all through it. At night, they sleep all together in the central room of the house. The fire glows over the large pillows that cover the floor with the tribe covering the pillows. They each have given to all the others complete access to each other's body. They massage each other until the secrets of tension and pain are revealed. Now they massage each other again to cure the pains. They learn to heal each other by saying magic words over and over again, and they learn to bring loving vibrations to the body to make it strong again. All this they share with all those around them who want to know. Each night in the big central room of the house, when sleep comes, they hold each other until they hardly know where one of them stops and another one begins. Those who come to visit sleep with them in the great central room on the huge pillows with the fire glowing. Down the street in a house sitting nearly on the sidewalk, with not one drape on any window, is the house of the heavy, horny hunks, known affectionately in the neighborhood as Horny Heaven. These faggots love to fuck and suck in public, in bathrooms and in parks, in trucks and in warehouses, under bridges and near train tracks, in front of their naked windows and in the parking lot nearby. To stimulate their lust, they make movies of their activities, which they show selectively in the neighborhood, and they sniff ancient, potent powders, which they sell discreetly in the neighborhood. 
In the barn in the back of their house, they run the faggot fuck palace. Here on wooden floors, fluffy pillows and round spinning beds and soft carpets, the faggots love each other. Here in swirling water and steamy rooms and soft lights, the faggots love each other. Here, with their heads filled with the magic powder, the faggots sing an old tune, dance a new step, tell a bad joke, and thank the great goddess for such a fine place. On the corner, the gay-as-a-goose tribe looks after the mellow space they have created there out of an old grocery store. They cover the walls with old wood, hung ferns everywhere, allowed three pussycats to live there, put soft chairs and homemade tables around, and made food for the community in an old, funky kitchen in the back. They read palms and the magic cards and the sacred stars. They make music and dance the old dances. Moonbeam can sit all day and half the night in the soft chair, eating sprouts and sweets, knitting and watching the faggots and their friends play. All the community's information moves through this mellow corner space. Pine Tree never misses a day, for to him the community's gossip is the same as the news from the revolution. At the end of the street sits a carved house with closed cropped lawns and discreet flower gardens. Here live a group known on the street as the boys in the back room. They can put the fix in to help a friendly faggot in distress. They help protect the community from the dangers of the men. They can play all the men's games, and the dirtier the better. They say they have, over many years, taught themselves to look, talk, and act, though not feel like the men. They did not learn this easily, nor with great pleasure, but they learned it well. They live quietly, listening to old music, reading old books, surrounded by old things and drinking a lot. They like each other enough to stay home and get drunk together. Hollyhock visits one night every week. He draws comfort from the order of their lives and from the humor, the source of their sanity, which is ironic and bitter. They know too much of the men's evil to believe in anything anymore, except domestic tranquility and work for others. In one of the rooms is a long table. Here they sit together to write their briefs and their tracts and their analyses and their letters of protest. They write with eloquence against the men, using the men's own language to embarrass them and sometimes even to rout them. Daffodil and Woodthrush, after lifetimes of pleasure and pain, moved with friends into a structure of light and gleaming wood next to the boys in the back room. Daffodil and Woodthrush had lived together in a love with delicate balance for many years. Then one day the love turned to hate and they both went crazy. Daffodil wrapped himself up in grandeur and descended upon the men. Robes and jewels and scents moved through the streets. The men thought this vision was a woman, and so they stole from him and yelled at him and hit him. They loved him, and they hated him for the pleasure. He thought then that he deserved it. He could not be worthwhile unless Woodthrush loved him. Woodthrush became melancholy. The language of the academics obsessed him. He dreamed of accumulating knowledge and awoke tired from the weight. His sexual organ shriveled up. It would occasionally twitch involuntarily. Love came back to Daffodil and Woodthrush as soon as they understood reality. In the joy of reconciliation, they joined with friends and moved to their structure of light and gleaming wood next to the boys in the back room. Here they are free to move their heads into the revolution. Here they learn to trust the reality of feelings surrounded by reassuring ritual. They call themselves Elegant City, and in their structure of light and wood, they pursue the bourgeois rituals of old. The forms remain pure. The instructions are carefully, though never obsessively, followed. The table is set up properly, and the spoons are used in the proper order. The liquors are drunk in the correct sequence, and each sits correctly on the couches to talk. Although the talk is subversive and salacious, it is never loud or coarse. Their life has become elegant and stable, allowing warmth and sharing and radical action to flow outward. The no-name tribe lives in an inconspicuous house set back from the street, shaded by tall, enveloping spruce trees. No one in the community speaks about them or what they do, although everyone speaks to them. They live quiet, apparently decent lives, sitting at home in front of large looms weaving cloth and tapestries. They study esoteric manuals, old maps, calligraphy, and the banking system. Exactly who is a member of the tribe remains publicly, purposefully vague. They try to be present in the community, yet inconspicuous, for they are one link in a vast network of fugitives from the men.
For this work, they needed a community to fade into, and faggots among faggots all look alike to the men. Here they feel safe. They are experts at recreating the official documents of the men to make new official identities for the fugitives. They know about bombs and how to make them. They know about locks and how to pick them. And they know about prisons and how to get out of them. Although they do not do any of these things themselves, they aid the fugitives, who do do these things in any way they can. Sometimes they receive money taken by force from the men and give it to the fugitives. Sometimes they give the fugitives information the fugitives need to outwit the men. Sometimes they drive the fugitives from one place to another in their spiffy Mabel's Bakery truck. Those times, and there are many of them, when the fugitives are hidden even from them, they sit at home in front of the large looms, weaving cloth and tapestries and studying esoteric manuals, old maps, calligraphy, and the banking system, and talking about the time when the faggots and their friends will be free. There are many other faggots who live here on Pansy Path, eccentrics and ne'er-do-wells of all kinds, street merchants and belly dancers, glass cutters and leather feather collectors, corner poets and medicine fags, sewers of cloth and imitators of stars. Day after day, witnessing this exquisite elaboration of types, Lilac's imagination will begin to vibrate from being so stretched. The tribe of the rising suns is pleased to have found this place to be. Pine Tree is amazed that the revolution has come so far and looks so beautiful. Lilac is thrilled. Heavenly Blue feels at home and safe. Loose Tomato talks of moving to the Bronx and marrying his sister. Hollyhock feels full of activity and faggot contact. And Moonbeam realizes he can, here, cease to be a non-man and become a person. Wherever the faggots settle, they wish it to be near the women. It is from the women that they learn wisdom and magic. Fortunately, under the highway, on the edge of the faggot community, work the honest women. They sell their skills to the men who will pay the most. So much to wash the dishes, a little more to paint a room, more than that to fix a car, and much, much more to fuck. They make a decent wage, steal from the men whenever they can, and go home after work to their own independent lives. They are friends of the faggots. They constantly exchange information with each other on the present state of the madness of the men. They commit espionage for each other so that each can survive. Beyond the elevated road in Amazon Acres live the women who love women, and the few of their children that the men will let them keep. Pat and Lee and Meredith live here in this world so unlike any that the men live in. Sometimes Pat and Lee and Meredith invite the rising suns to dinner, and sometimes the rising suns invite them to dinner. They exchange the latest stories about the men, stories of atrocities, violence, mendacity, and stupidity. They wonder if the men are getting weaker. They wonder what it is to be done to make the men weaker. They wonder if they are doing it. They talk of recent love affairs and hate affairs, friendships and death. The women, by now, know that they will win. They know that the days of the men are numbered. Life comes from the women and can go on only if they win. This knowledge, from deep inside, makes them jolly and strong. Meredith chuckles at Pine Tree's hopeless and so seemingly realistic assessment of the power of the men. Well, of course, she says, that is what the men want you to believe. But everyone will die if the men are allowed to go on with their ways, even the men. Those who do not want to die just yet must stop them, and we will. Heavenly Blue isn't sure. He knows the men fear life and might kill us all rather than give up. He wants to believe Meredith, but his faith is weak. Lilac encourages the women to talk. Their talking soothes his doubts. Their talking might make it so. Dessert is the best time. They gorge on fresh fruits from the fairies and whipped cream, on spicy cakes and gooey frostings, on thick puddings and on fresh pies. They exclaim and praise and eat until finally they relax and half doze. Now they talk of how much they care for each other, and how difficult and how rich their lives are. Pat says, how vast women's knowledge is. How wonderful to be one of the first in a thousand years to explore this. And how dreadful it is to be poor. The women who love women are nearly all poor, since the men control the money and give it only to women who sign the bondage contract. Pine Tree sighs. Poor is sad, but the rich do not experience deep loving friendship. They merely take care of their own kind, which is not the same. 
They all sigh. They know that without the uncalculated giving of affection, everyone is lost. They know that friendship freely given sustains them. The faggots once called themselves the men who love men, but they discovered that they did not love men. They loved only other men who loved men, which was not that many of the men. The men who hate others were false and death-inflicting and obsessed with being strangers. The men who hate others hate the men who love men. And this hatred is so strong that it turns the men who love men into the faggots. Take the case of Pine Tree. When he was young, his gentle mother told him that when he became a grown-up, he would be a grown-up man. Pine Tree liked to think about this. He liked men, grown-up or not. So he thought it would be okay to be a grown-up man. When he left his gentle mother for the men's indoctrination center, he heard other voices, harsh voices, demanding, be a man, at once. He did not know what to do and so became confused and frightened and longed for his gentle mother. Then the harsh voices told him what to do. Be mean to all the others and distrust other men. Over and over in every tone the harsh voices could manage, they repeated the instructions for being a man. Be mean to all the others and distrust other men. Pine Tree discovered that if he did not appear to be mean to all the others and to distrust other men, he would be hurt by the harsh voices. So he appeared to be mean to all the others and to distrust other men while longing to share with all the others and to cherish the other men. By the time Pine Tree left the men's indoctrination center, he knew that he would never be one of the men. He could not follow the admonitions of the harsh voices. He could barely appear to follow them anymore. In the devastated city, where he found himself alone and bewildered, he began to notice other men who appeared to share with all the others and to cherish some of the other men. Pine Tree did not know if what they appeared to be was what they felt, but what they appeared to be was what he felt, so he took a chance. One quick glance led to a longer look, which led to talk and touching and a good night kiss. Another quick glance led to a longer look and a smile, which led to talking and walking and lying in a big bed entwined with another man. A long look led to a smile, which led to talking and drinking and walking and making love and having breakfast and talking and walking and saying tomorrow. Pine Tree was not a man and he was not alone. He learned that he was a faggot and there were lots of faggots. They had all heard the harsh voices and none of them had believed them. Lilac knew from an early age, mainly from his grandmother, that it was not so wonderful to be one of the men. He was also told from an early age, mainly by his grandmother, that he did not have to try to be one of the men if he did not want to. He never wanted to, and so he never tried. He stayed by himself and played in fantasy. He lived in a world where he could be a mother or a father or a husband or a wife or a passive object or an aggressive force. He could be whatever felt like him. Some days he wore his grandmother's long dresses, and some days he wore his own short pants. He was Rita and Lana and June as often as he was Van and Carrie and Tyrone. He was glamorous when he woke up and seductive at night. He knew how to get a man from an early age, and he practiced this in his mind and waited. When he was young, the other boys called him Sissy. As he grew, the other boys called him Faggot. When he was a young man, the other men called him effeminate. When he walked down the street in the men's section of the devastated city, the men called him queer. Poor Lilac, he hardly knew what to call himself. Maybe a queer, effeminate, faggot sissy? Yet he did not know what to do when one day he met another man who had been called names and who had lived in his own dreams and who also knew what to do. It felt even better than Hetty and Jane and Marilyn had led him to imagine. After that, when the men called him names, he would smile. He knew a secret. Loose Tomato grew up tough. No one ever suspected that he was scared every time he walked down the street. Any lip and they got their ass kicked. Nobody fucked with him. Nobody asked any questions. He found that he liked wrestling most of all, but also general roughhousing and shower room smells and boys' sexual talk. Later, he grew to like drinking with the boys and hacking around in the car and letting faggots suck him off. Then he discovered that he liked to suck the faggots off and his life changed. He could no longer wrestle in innocence. He got a hard on from the shower room smells. When he got drunk with the boys, he became so friendly the boys got edgy and nasty. He wanted to talk to his friends about cocksucking, but was afraid of their fear and brutality. He began to drift away from the old neighborhood and the old bars and the old boys. 
He was looking for another who could have a few drinks and suck some cock without a lot of violence. He found himself leaning up against a wall in a dark, crowded bar. They had some drinks, smiled a lot, held hands, and finally went home to suck some cock. It was all done with innocence and joy. As the old boys figured out Loose Tomato's trip, they began whispering faggot. The whispers spread until everyone was saying faggot out loud. Loose Tomato got angry at the word and angry at his friends. Occasionally, he would come back to the old bars and threaten to kick some ass. But his heart wasn't in it, and he did not convince them. Mostly, he spent his conscious life in bars looking at the faggots. Sometimes he went home with someone. He was waiting for the day when he would love. Moonbeam always tried to be a good boy. He played nice with the other kids. He never talked back to his mom and dad, and he kept his room tidy. He took care of his loyal dog. He made good marks in school, and he went to bed on time. They lived in a nice house with nice neighbors in a nice small town. Everyone behaved as they were expected to behave in this only of all possible worlds. From an early age, Moonbeam knew what shape his life would take. He would imagine it over and over. As he grew up, he would go to a good school so he could become a good worker like his dad. He would marry a good girl so he could have good children like he had been. He would belong to a nearly fancy country club where he would play a good game of golf and a better game of bridge. He would live in a nice house and die at the appropriate time, leaving enough money behind so his good children could go to good schools to become good workers like their father had been. He knew the shape of his life so well that when it was time to begin it, he was bored with the whole idea of it. Hoping to leave the boredom behind, he proceeded to do the opposite of what had been expected of him. He left the good school and refused to work. He moved to a dark room in the devastated city. He spent his nights in bars where he played a lousy game of pool and always got drunk. He masturbated and never had dates with women. As it became clear that his strategy was working, Moonbeam moved deeper into the contrary. His hair grew, his clothes disintegrated, his head filled with women's wisdom. He allowed himself to become a criminal, and then he fell in love with a faggot. This was too much. His good parents forced Moonbeam, for his own good, to have contact with one of the men's mind butchers. Moonbeam told the mind butcher lies, and the mind butcher told Moonbeam lies. This did no harm. Then the mind butcher put Moonbeam on a rack and shot huge amounts of energy through his body to his brain. This could do harm, so Moonbeam hid from the mind butcher and his good parents until they all lost interest. And by then, he was so deeply into being a faggot outlaw that there was no going back. The faggots are always in some kind of trouble. One day, Luz Tomato and Moonbeam went to see the bishop. He was dressed in flowing, rich robes. Loose Tomato was so thrilled at the sight that he wanted to give the bishop a gift, so he splashed some tasty cock juice on the bishop's robes. The bishop became incensed, enraged, and overcome. What will the other bishops think, he screamed, and ordered trouble for the faggots. Once when he was young, Hollyhock was ordered to join the men and go off and kill some other men. When he arrived at the killing place, he was so overwhelmed by the gentle beauty of those he was to kill and they were so overwhelmed by his sweet radiance that they fell into each other's arms for love. General Waste More of Everything went bananas and ordered trouble for the faggots. Heavenly Blue once worked in one of the men's indoctrination centers. He played with the kids and treated the girls and boys alike. This soon came to the attention of the authorities. They were shocked and ordered Heavenly Blue to begin at once to work, not play with the kids, and to treat girls like girls and boys like boys. He might have complied with the authorities if he could have remembered what they said exactly. But something was always coming up with him and the kids to please him and make him forget the authorities. Authorities must be obeyed or else they cannot be called authorities. So in a hail of denunciation and alarm, they ordered Heavenly Blue removed from the center and ordered trouble for the faggots. Survival. Strategy. Once the men tried to stop the queens, first they declared them non-existent. If they did not exist, no man could be punished for harming them since they did not exist. The queens refused to hide. They dug deeper into the ruins of the devastated city. On the streets, they continued to love and talk and plan and notice. 
and the men continued to beat them and starve them and lock them up when they could catch them, trying to kill them softly. Often the fairies would come from the country, and the faggots and the fairies would transform themselves into queens and join the queens on the streets. The men would think that there was oh so many queens and go away. But they always came back with harder, bigger ramrods to make the queens into men. The men became more ferocious, and the queens suffered. Gradually, the queens began to fade away from the sight of the men. The men thought they had liquidated the queens, but the queens had merged into the general strangeness of the city. Since the queens look something like women sometimes, and since the women who love women look something like women sometimes, and since the queens and the women who love women were friends, the men lost the queens among the women who love women. At another time, the men began to get paranoid about the women who love women. There were so many of them, and they kept attracting the women who men fuck. So the men began to issue more frequent pronouncements on the propriety and etiquette of the ownership of women. In a moment of panic, after Warren and his fuckpole's daughter announced that now she was a woman who loved women, the men declared all women who men fuck state property, and all women who love women outlaws. The women who love women did not notice that their lives changed much. They had always been out of the law, and the men saying it once more did not make it any more true. But sometimes the men would become vicious beyond the ordinary because they could not stop women from loving women. At these times, the women who love women would merge into the general strangeness of the city. Since the women who love women look something like men, sometimes, and since the faggots look something like men, sometimes, and since the women who love women and the faggots were friends, the men lost the women who love women among the faggots. If the men give you something, you get nothing. Loose Tomato is sitting on a pillow drinking a mint julep and writing a love poem when Lilac rushes in with the news that they have all just become legal. How can faggots be legal, Loose Tomato scoffs? It's true. The boys in the back room just got the word from a slimy stool pigeon who knows everything. As the surprise spreads down Pansy Path, everyone gathers at the Gay as a Goose Cafe to wonder at such an unexpected event. The men would never do such a thing. Maybe they will want to register us all now to make our liquidation easier. Maybe they got confused and thought they were making faggot killing legal. As the days pass, it turns out that it is true. Pine Tree says, it can't last. Lilac swoons at the thought of just being legal. Loose Tomato starts elaborating tests to see just how legal he really is. After a week, the faggots of Horny Heaven put a neon sign on their barn proclaiming it as the faggot fuck palace and invite everyone to a party. The party goes on for nearly a week. No one can think of any reason to stop celebrating this peculiar event. Barely recognized from so much good feeling, the boys in the back room hear from the slimy stool pigeon that the men without color did make a mistake and will not allow this situation to continue. The faggots and their friends got 140 days, then the party's over. The faggots wait. What form will the men's wrath take this time? The big money says, let God take care of this one. He's done little enough lately. So Mildred Munich, whose direct line to God was widely whispered and whose hatred of faggots is legendary among her short-haired fans, is hired to lead the men in one of their favorite games, humiliate the faggots. Every morning, Mildred Munich pours over the book of insults that the men compiled for just such situations. Every evening, she appears in front of crowds of stone-faced, tight-ass lookalikes who scream as she shouts the insult of the evening. The faggots and their friends are called sick. Sinners, liars, traitors, seducers, perverted, weak, silly, and ugly. The faggots and their friends organize themselves quickly. The boys in the back room issue eloquent denunciations of Mildred Munich's filth and contact all of their important contacts seeking support. The fairies send food to the cafe, which gives it away to all who need nourishment for the fight. The fuck palace begins a round the clock suck-in in order to raise money. Heavenly Blue is panicked. He takes to his bed to be alone with his fear. Lilac is frantic with anger. He and Loose Tomato and Pine Tree move about the community collecting and sharing information. The queens leave their elegant dens in the rubble and take over the streets. The faggots and their friends fight knowing they will lose. 140 days and the neighbors and the colleagues and the families and the men's money and power 
and Mildred Munich's hate speeches make, through legal means, the faggots and their friends illegal once more. I feel more like my old self already, Loose Tomato exclaims. Heavenly Blue thinks being illegal is better. When we were legal, they called us every dirty name they could think of. Now maybe they will shut up. Lilac, who had been thrilled to be legal, now has to agree. We can get on with our subversion, he chuckles as he eats a mushroom. I guess, Pine Tree muses. We know now that if the men give you anything, you get nothing. If we want it, we gotta take it away from them. Action. Fierce against the men. One warm and rainy night, the faggots and their friends were gathered in one of their favorite cellars, dancing and stroking each other gently. Suddenly, the men, armed with categories in their minds and guns in their hands, appeared at the door. The faggots, true to their training for survival, scrammed out the back windows, up into the alley, and out into the anonymous night. The queens, unable to scram in their gold lame and tired of just surviving, stayed. They waited until boldness and fear made them resourceful. Then, armed with their handbags and their high heels, they let out a collective shriek, heard round the world, and charged the men. The sound, one never heard before, unnerved the men long enough for the queens to get out onto the streets. And once out onto the streets, their turf, mayhem, broke out. The word went out, and from all over the devastated city, queens moved on to the streets, armed to shout and fight. The faggots, seeing smoke, cautiously came out of hiding and joyously could hardly believe what they saw. Elegant, fiery, exuberant queens were tearing up the street, building barricades, delivering insults, daring the men. So they joined the queens, and for three days and three nights, the queens and their friends told the men, in every way they knew how, to fuck off. Celebration Each year, the faggots and their friends celebrate the coming of summer. On the summer solstice, they show themselves to the world. The fairies make floats of hay and locust branches on their trucks. They make clothes from the daisies and buttercups and the pansies and the Indian paintbrushes. They move slowly down the country roads, singing to the maple trees and the wild roses. In a field high in the hills, they gather to eat sweet pea flowers and drink dandelion wine. The wine and the smell of the flowers make them exuberant. The soft bodies and the melting sun make them ecstatic. The faggots arise late and have coffee in the garden. They slowly prepare to appear on the streets to celebrate. They sit, surrounded by their beloved plants and loose cats, to comb each other's hair. Some of the faggots have only wisps of hair falling in long curls from the ring of their scalp. Others have wild, free hair floating all over the garden. Their hair is carefully brushed and braided, repeating a loving action yet one more time. They dress according to their latest dreams, take some of their magic substances, and stroll out into the streets. The queens are already there. They have been preparing themselves for days. The faggots are dressed for play. The queens are dressed to live in another world. They have allowed their tatters of tinsel and lace to turn them into fantastic creatures that the world has never seen before. On this one day, all the men play golf and leave the faggots and their friends alone to cavort and amuse each other in the streets of the devastated city. Through the streets alive now with balloons and streamers and children and animals and laughter and songs and glitter, they meander until they reach a large field in the middle of the city. Here the women who love women sing songs of defiance and love and instruct the faggots and their friends in new ways to perceive. Together and joyous, they form a circle to salute the great goddess. They sway and chant. The circle begins to move faster and faster. Sound and movement make them high. Exhausted and elated, they fall to the ground laughing. The great goddess is pleased. Action. Bold against the men. For gentle outrageousness, Aramel, one of the queens, was locked in Ramrod's camp for the undesirables. There he could not resist pouting and cooing and prancing and provoking the ramrod men locked up with him. The undesirables have a chant. Fuck a queen and you're a faggot. Fuck a queen and you're a faggot. Which was supposed to protect them from Aramel's charm. Yet often the chant failed. Then Aramel would get raped. And each time this happened was further evidence that Aramel must remain locked in. As might be expected, Loose Tomato had fallen in love with Aramel. When Aramel was taken away, Loose Tomato wept. 
He missed Aramel so much that he became numb and desperate. So one day he walked into one of the men's money depositories with one of the men's guns in hand and ordered everyone to shut up, be calm, and hand over the cash. Then he called the delicatessen and ordered a pastrami and rye for everyone. Next, he called Warren and his footpole to announce his demands. The money, Aramel, and two tickets to someplace else. Since the men control the whole world and none of the men anywhere like faggots and queens, it was hard to figure out where the someplace else was to be. Warren was livid as usual and called out his thugs and goons who could think of nothing to do but move through the streets terrorizing people. The boys in the back room quickly arranged for the release of Aramel and the no-name tribe slipped him into hiding. The queens of the devastated city surrounded the money depository to play havoc with the goons and the thugs, creating so much chaos that loose tomatoes slipped away with the money and his pastrami on ride to join Aramel in hiding. They had found a place to be. Action. Gentle against the men. For the love of his fantasies for a glorious nonviolent revolution, Pine Tree decided to act. He made a very small sign which said freedom and sat down in front of the house of Warren and his footpole. He just sat there, smiling, drinking water, talking to anyone who came about the glorious nonviolent revolution. Moonbeam and Heavenly Blue and Hollyhock came every day to sit with him. Lilac, afraid that the men would hurt him when no one was watching, sat with him each night, all night. The longer he sat there with his little sign, saying his gentle words, the more distraught the men became. Warren and his footpole was close to collapse. Something had to be done. So the men read out their rules and marched into their courts of vengeance. Lilac alerted the boys in the back room who strolled into the courts of vengeance and shamelessly outmaneuvered the men. The men then brought out their mind butchers, who examined Pine Tree from a distance and pronounced him out of his mind and therefore dangerous to public reality. Late that night, the men came for Pine Tree. Although his soul ached, Lilac was brave in order to make Pine Tree strong. They took him to a ramrod camp for undesirables, locked him in a cage, and fondled the cold metal key of their victory. The boys in the back room moved swiftly, but unsuccessfully, to free Pine Tree. Lilac and his friends were fearful. They cautiously approached the weavers of no name for help. The weavers listened gravely, smiling sympathetically, and told them to go and find a place to live near the great gardens of the fairies. Pine Tree would join them soon. They all left the devastated city at once and went to the fairies who received them with softness and kindness. They built a small house of hiding in the woods at the foot of the hill near the stream, and there they waited, until one night, late, They heard Pine Tree's song of love floating down the stream toward the house of hiding. How delicious that reunion was. Soon, too soon for Lilac, the tribe of the rising suns moved back to the devastated city to resume the appearance of normal life. Pine Tree remained behind with the fairies to create a new face and a new past to get him through his new present. He emerged as Jack Daniels, a soft-spoken male house painter. He moved to a new devastated city to practice Jack Daniels and to wait for the other out-of-sight faggots to contact him. The tribe of the Rising Suns knew they will not know Pine Tree again until the revolutions are more advanced. They know they will not see Aramel and Loose Tomato again until the revolutions are more advanced. They go back to the devastated city to see what is to be done next. How to Proceed, Emerging Wisdom from the Women The faggots and their friends and the women who love women can keep the men off balance for a long time by subtly, but continuously, changing their identities. The men who are in charge of controlling it all find it difficult always to know how many of each kind there are and who they are. Each group can grow and shrink as the men's changing ferociousness demands. But the men's viciousness will grow as their panic increases. They carry with them the knowledge always that there are enemies. And even when the men have trouble seeing the enemies clearly, they do not stop punishing. To punish, at random if necessary, is believed effective against the enemies. The faggots and their friends and the women who love women know that for a while they can find some safety in the confusion they can create. They have some time to develop their resources to survive. Yet at some point, collectively, they will begin to know that the men will continue as long as they continue. 
They can play with the men's categories to try to neutralize the men's guns, yet this will not make them free. They begin to know from the inside that they cannot be free until this dance is stopped. The men will not stop, for they have nothing else to do. This dance brings the men's riches, power, and fame, and they will keep it going as long as they are able. The faggots and their friends, and the women who love women can, they begin to know, stop, and do nothing. This is something for them to do. They will begin slowly to move their energy from the men's deathly dance to a stillness. No movement and high invisible energy will be their goal. They will begin slowly. They will fast a few days at a time until they do not need to eat unless they want to eat. They will put aside from time to time their magic substances until they do not need their magic substances and take them only when they want to. They will begin to abstain from sex to rest from the exhausting chase and get. They will stop flirting and seducing until they no longer need to warm another body to feel real. Then they can make love when they want to. As what they need decreases, their activity decreases. They will then be close to doing nothing, and therefore close to not being what the men created them to be. They will cease to be other, and the men will begin to fear for their own sanity. The men's needs are strong and overwhelming. They need the faggots and their friends in order to know who they are not. But the faggots and their friends will no longer need the men. They can sit and produce high, invisible love energy, or they can do nothing. But they will not need. And when the faggots and their friends cease being the faggots and their friends, the deathly dance of the men will begin to wane, and a new dance will begin to emerge. Then the third revolutions will engulf us all. From Larry Mitchell, 1977. The idea for the faggots and their friends came to me one drizzling stone night hanging out on Castro Street in San Francisco, watching those amazing faggots playing on that amazing street. I thought it would be a children's book, and I worked on it off and on for a couple of years. By then, I thought it was done, and I knew it was not a children's book. My friends read it, and as friends do, praised me for my efforts. They, however, did not think it was done. So I worked on it again, off and on, for another year when I decided it was done. I asked Ned, with whom I lived in the Lavender Hill Commune, and whose work I had long admired, to illustrate it. I did not want to become involved with a big publishing company, so I submitted the manuscript to small presses. The straight ones found it to their liking for various vague reasons, and the gay men's publishing concerns, while positive about the content, were also broke that they could barely publish the few things they were already committed to publishing. So we decided to do it ourselves. It is an old American tradition, after all. With the support of our loving friends here, it has been easier than we thought and much more fun than we anticipated. The Faggots and Their Friends Between Revolutions is the first book from Calamus Books. Mm -hmm.